All right. Big ideas with Big Al and all of you. You know, this is what this is about. All of you as well, because you know we all have really great ideas, and we all know some things where other people don't, and we can go back and forth. So, um, Rhonda, recycle Rhonda, myself, and Emily Johnston, who is doing a repair cafe together uh, today. Uh, we have been working on this since a couple months ago. Um, yeah, we're really excited to share all this with you. So I'm coming from Wyndham Solid Waste Management District, which is in Brattleboro and the 18 surrounding towns around Bla Brattleboro, so south, uh, southeast. And then we've got Recycle Rhonda up north, up north to the west. And Emily Johnston, and I don't know where Addison County is. We live on these computers now. Um, it's just, uh, south of Chittenden County. Cool, cool. All right. So right right under Chittenden. So that's where we're coming from. And we're all, you know, outreachy, educatey type people. So this is fun. Um, not sure if you were all here with us last uh this past Tuesday with Recycle Rhonda, but if you were, um try and think about what were some of the problems that you noticed with recycling as it stands today? And if you weren't at Recycle Rhonda's talk, but you have some, you know, thoughts on recycling or questions, what are, what are some of the problems, uh, yeah, that that you have noticed in the recycling world? So I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to put that question up so they can put a little short answer in. Let's see. No, I don't have anything now. Yeah. Yeah, number number one, what are some problems that you know about in the recycling world? And I'll give it some time. And you can type those into the poll if hopefully you see the poll. Yeah, does everyone see it? <laughs> I've never made a poll on the fly like that, so I'm not sure how they work. Obviously, they <laughs> all come up together. So I think all of the questions are coming up together. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody has been able to use it. That's very awesome. Excellent. Okay, cool. And do you want me to end this? Um, sure. All right. I'm just having a bit of trouble with yeah, I'm not how about I'm not gonna look at anything. I'm gonna have you look at it because I'm starting to um fly through my slides by accident. Okay. I will uh do all of the looking here. Um yeah. So what are some problems you know about in the recycling world? Um, one person says, uh, not everything we want to recycle is getting recycled. Yeah. Um, another one says, what do you do with a product that has a lot of different components? Or what to do with a product that has a lot of different components? Um, Miss Ward's classes, um, we are told to throw away the world-centric certified compostable mm -hmm. foodware um, and create a better way to make things with recycled materials, also mm -hmm. from Miss Ward's class. Yeah, finding ways to make things with recycled materials, that's great. Um, that's a great idea. Um, and it's also a real big challenge. Um not everything that we want to recycle is recyclable. Maybe you've heard the term of wish cycling. I wish to, I wish this would be recycled. So I'll just put it in the blue bin and hopefully it will be. That's something that, you know, I'm sure Rhonda deals with at the Murph at Chittenden a lot. And you see a lot of things that you're just like, huh, that can't, that's not supposed to go in there. And what happens when um, you put something in the recycling bin that's not recyclable, it gets thrown away but it takes an extra trip to the MRF first. So that's kind of, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world if you put something that's not dangerous into the blue bin, it just gets thrown away, but it does take that extra road trip, which, you know, if you're thinking about carbon and CO2, um, different components, yeah, 
that's that's really tricky because you know we used to have waxed milk cartons and now it seems that it's a plastic liner so when you're mixing and melting lots of different things together it's really hard to take them back apart again expensive to do uh difficult and the compostable plastic thing yeah that's um that's definitely one of the newer things that we're all dealing with um, at Wyndham Solid Waste Management District. We have a composting field. Um, we make compost and we accept compostable plastic. It has to be certified, but a lot of composting folks don't take it. Um, and beyond that, there's not a whole ton of composting folks out there. So it ends up having to be trashed because we can't recycle it. So. Yeah, and in our so for Miss Ward's class, who's in Chittenden County, um, yeah, any of the compostable certified compostable foodware, um, we no longer accept at uh, Green Mountain Compost because not because it won't compost, but because with it comes a lot of trash, um, yeah. and so a lot of people can't tell the difference between what is truly compostable what's real plastic or even, um, you know, like milk cartons versus compostable soup cups. They kind of look at them like they're all cardboard. They all go in there. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that these um, recycling problems, it's not so much about what things are made of. It's more what our brains and behavior and culture does with them. And that's one of the hardest challenges out there is changing someone's mind about what is true? <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to move on. We're going to talk about plastics today. So plastics, you know, there's a lot of plastics out there that aren't being recycled right now. There's a lot of things that are mixed with plastic, like the milk cartons. So that makes it not recyclable. And then the compostable, uh, recyclable plastic mix up. That's a big one too. So plastic uh, is one of the materials that's causing a lot of a lot of trouble in the recycling industry. Um, there are so many different types of plastics out there. And in order to recycle them, they need to be clean and dry. They need to be the right type. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why it ends up in, in our environment here and there. It's flying off of this and that. I just want to, you know, let all the folks know out there, though, we're not intentionally dumping things into the ocean. Um, I get a lot of schools that at least one person will be like, I'll ask, where is a way? Where do we put our garbage? And they'll be like, oh, we put it in the ocean. <laughs> oh, no. No, it acts, it definitely ends up there, but it, we're not intentionally putting it there. Um, yeah, we live in a plastic world these days. Um, and what we would, what I have been thinking a lot about lately is just like what plastic is made of in the first place. Um, I didn't really connect that plastic was a part of the oil industry, but plastics are made of something called petrochemicals, meaning derived from oil or coal. Um, so that means it's really sturdy and long lasting, but hard to get rid of, won't break down. Um, and there's lots of great reasons why we use plastic. It's not, you know, the worst thing in the world to use. Um, it's great because it can be safe on skin. You know, think about hospitals use a lot of plastic. It's important. Um, safe to eat off of. A lot of food containers that we pick up at the grocery store made of plastic. It doesn't leak, you know. Um, and um, underneath our houses and apartments and cities, there's lots of tubing that goes around um, carrying in water, clean water to drink and carrying out sewage stuff from our toilets. A lot of that is plastic and a lot of that is recycled plastic too. Um, but it's very sturdy. It doesn't break down when it's wet or really hot or really cold. So what are some of the things that we're all doing right now? That's what I wanna let you know. Um, there's something called EPR, uh, extended producer responsibility. I like to call it responsibility of the makers. And that's where the makers are creating a product that's easy to recycle or and or they're labeling it really clearly, not just a tiny little translucent symbol, but really, truly, clearly, you know what to do with it when you're done with it or it doesn't work anymore. Um, or 
free programs are created. Uh, for instance, um, at our transfer station and probably Chittenden, we take free paint cans, even with paint in it, because um, the the paint industry, I suppose, has realized that this this has been a big problem going into landfill. So they want to create a free, easy, accessible um, way for us to deal with those things that are filling up our basements. Um, another thing that's happening in the recycling world is um, states get money. Um, you know, there are whole industries built on this. And so, for instance, let's see what I say about states and money. States and money. <laughs> Funding from the state helps uh, recycling centers buy new machinery. It helps put on programs like what we're doing right now. Rhonda and I are paid, you know, but it's a municipal government kind of thing. Um, and we're paid to help talk about this with you, which is awesome. Um, school programs help a lot with the recycling. Um, different schools will take initiatives depending on what the students, the parents, the staff, the administration, facilities, what, what everybody wants. Um, recently, the Halifax School in Vermont, it's down near me, they got a new water filtering water bubbler or water fountain, however you want to say it. So they did a grant. And what is why would I talk about a water filter uh, or a water bubbler with recycling? Well, what happens when you have really clean water ready to use? You don't have to keep bringing in bottles and bottles and bottles and bottles. You can reuse them over and over again. And what I love about those things, they have a little counter that tells you how many bottles you've saved from the landfill or from, you know. And then there's the big old law and, um, you know, there are federal laws, meaning the whole nation. And then there's, you know, state to state. Um, one law that Vermont has, which is really cool is, you know, it's illegal. You can't put hazardous waste into the landfill. So things like um, pesticides, it's a type of poison, um, things like the paint cans, things like food because they can be composted. So that's another way that we, um, make the world of waste a little bit better. So think to yourself, like there's lots of different ways to tackle recycling or plastics or waste, however you want to call it. Would you, let's throw up that poll again. Would you want to create better recycling facilities? Do we just need better tools to recycle the things that we make? Do we need to make new products that are only like only recyclable or you know that will biodegrade do we need to banish materials from our shelves that are not recyclable um, do we need to create a better way to handle trash so we can throw more away or would you think of something else it's complicated right there's so many different ways to tackle this so it did relaunch the poll, but then some people had answered it because both of those oh, cool. questions went out the first time. Right. So um, there was uh, two um, folks out there that said create new products made yeah. of easy to recycle materials. Yeah. Three out of three um, respondents said ban materials from stores that are not able to be recycled. Yeah. Currently, those are the two two things that seem to be uh, what everybody's choosing, and I like it. Yeah, yeah, and there's no wrong answers here, of course. There's so many different ways to tackle this. Again, like on the maker side and on the cleanup side, you know, we have to work at all of these different places in this challenging situation. Thank you for taking that poll. So um, next up. I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what it's kind of what, what's going on in what's called the material recovery facility or material recycling facility. So when you recycle with a transfer station or somebody picks it up, it will be going to one of these facilities, the MRF. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what it looks like inside um, and kind of the machinery that they're using. If I, yeah. Can you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Can you hang on for just a sec? There was a question from Ms. Ward's class early on of about how many categories are there for recycling? And I can say at our MRF here in Chittenden County, which takes in the northern half of the Boobin Recyclables, we have 10 different categories that we sort into. Um, it would be glass aggregates, so your spaghetti jars and things like that. 
Um, we do cardboard, shredded paper, mixed paper, which is like your junk mail, your old homework assignments that you aced, all that good stuff. Um, we've got with the plastics, it's four categories of plastic. Number one, drink bottles. Number two, milk jugs. Number two, colored plastic, which is like your laundry detergent bottles. And then uh, number five, plastics. Yeah. Uh, for metal, it's aluminum and steel cans. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, <laughs> I think that's it. All right, great. I wasn't counting. Yeah, yeah. So there's still, you know, there's a lot more products out there in the world than what Murphs take. But we do try, you know, as working in outreach, we try and help folks to know what things are um, recyclable. All right, let's, let's, I'm going to jump ahead here. Where is a way? Zoop. Upon entering the Murph, there was a lot of noise and dust flying everywhere. This mammoth heap probably arrived earlier that same morning. Soon, this mountain of recyclables will be source separated into categories that they can then ship out to become new and useful everyday items. Now we're in the belly of the beast, where we get to see all of the different separation techniques. About 95% of the work is done by machines and 5% is done by people. First up, is paper and cardboard, which goes through fiber separation techniques. All of this cardboard will be baled and shipped throughout the eastern seaboard. Then it's on to general single stream recycling. Here we can see a number of contaminants from waxy paper to actual food items, like this potato. The first line of defense in efficient source separation are human eyes and hands. I said earlier that 5% of the work is done by people. This equates to 10 to 12 humans on the line each day, separating diligently by hand. They have a space to put landfill trash, fiber materials, and the window they're standing in front of indicates what type of recyclable they're trying to identify. Every single item that comes through the MRF is judged individually. That means that if your curbside bin has a few contaminants in it, it's not all getting thrown out. It will still make it to the MRF, and the MRF's goal is to recycle as much as possible. After it goes through people, the machines get to do their work, from using gravity, to vacuums, to blowers, to magnets. It separates all the remaining stuff. You'd think that aluminum doesn't have a magnetic field, but it actually, when it's moving, a slight current is detected. It can then be separated and put into its own pile. The magnets must be working because upon inspecting the bales of aluminum, we see very little contamination. This robotic vacuum was put on the line a couple of days before we arrived. It optically identifies each material using lasers and then sucks up the target to put it into its own pile. It works quite quickly and the data is tracked continuously. On the computer screen, we can see that the robot is recording things like volume of materials on the belt. And if we look closely, we can see it identifying different types of plastic and even noting their color in real time. All of these bales get shipped throughout the Eastern Seaboard daily to be turned into a number of different items. Number one plastics into bottles, carpets, and fleece garments. Number two plastics into bottles and jugs. Number five plastic into plant pots and mixing bowls. Aluminum into things like bicycle frames. And the list goes on. All right, cool. So yeah, that that was a sneak peek into the Rutland Murph, which <laughs> is where all of our stuff goes. It's pretty similar to the one in Chittenden. I don't know if you got that vacuum sucker thing yet. It's, it's yeah, we don't have uh, anything fancy except for an electromagnet that takes off the steel cans. Okay. We don't even have an eddy current for the oh. aluminum. That's all yeah. hand picked as well. So we are, uh, well, hopefully in two years we'll have a really nice fun one like uh rutlands but uh right now we're just uh the old people power 
these, these are the kinds of things that, you know, if, if you're on the, I want to learn how to recycle better, like on the tool side, that's what to think of, you know, these machines, they cost a lot of money. You have to justify it with having enough stuff coming in because all of those bales that get shipped out, they have a price tag on them. We can sell them for a good amount if it's really clean and well done. So that's the goal. Um, and as you saw in the video also, it's like you, if you're really into computers, if you're really into technical stuff, there's a place for you in, in the world, of course, in the, in the recycling world, if you want to be there. And if you're more into like using your hands and just getting dirty, that's kind of like how I am. There's a place for you there too. You know, it, there's so many different skills that are so useful. Um, I'm going to go to my first problem problem plastic. This is a really big problem in the world right now, microplastics or teeny tiny plastic. Um, I lifted a quote from something called the Difficult to Manage Materials Survey report of 2023. Um, it's saying that current practices at materials recovery facilities and plastic recycling facilities focus on shredding and grinding. Uh, this fatality facilitates making marketable nurdles. Look that one up. That's a fun word, nurdles. Um, recent studies have shown that much of the original mass of collected plastics is lost as fine dusts, which can become air and waterborne. So the way in which we've decided to, or the way that we can easily create new things out of old plastic actually creates a lot of trouble. So I have a question that I'm just going to ask verbally, and maybe you can put it into the Q&A. Um, how could we reduce the amount of plastic dust escaping the, the mills or the plastic recycling facilities? How do you think we could reduce the amount of dust that comes from taking a bunch of dry plastic, shredding it up so that we can make something new? That, that's a big, that's a real world problem happening right now. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about it. And this dust, it, yeah, it gets into the water. So little tiny fish and big fish and plankton are eating it. Do you know where else microplastics get? Your boogers. That's right. They're all in your mucus. Um, that was bad news for me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it really truly gets everywhere. And they can like sink into different parts of your bodies. And we don't necessarily know all the different things that that means yet. Um, but it's definitely something that feels a little unnatural. So does anyone have any ideas about how we can reduce the amount of plastic dust in the environment or in this, uh, you know, the way that we handle plastics? Miguel, I think you've got everybody thinking hard. Oh, but hang on. Here we go. Here we go. Because I was like, there was nothing coming through. But huh. um, I'm not saying this is easy, <laughs> but I'm not grading you at all. <laughs> all right. So Renee says uh, adding enough heat to plastics while manufacturing Ooh. new materials to reduce dust during shredding and cutting. Good cool. Point. Yeah, this I like that. Miss Ward's classes to deal with dust. We think someone needs to invent a blower or a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Definitely something that can just. We've got better dust filtration. Right. Yeah, Karen. better filtration. Definitely. That's a good idea. Miss Ward's class. Well, no, I don't know these answers. This is, right. this is us just, you know, working on stuff. Right. Uh, another possible solution for Miss Ward's class is maybe something with water to catch the dust. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's a good thing that we're recording these Q&As. Yeah, because, definitely. Uh, we have yeah. one more that I saw, and I, and I totally agree. Um, Pam is saying, try to get away from our reliance on plastic products and reduce the number that needs to be replaced needs to be processed and mm. and in some ways shapes and forms i don't need plastic for everything right but has anyone ever tried to go plastic free for a day for a week did you know that some of our clothing is plastic did you know that you know carpeting is plastic like i don't know how far that challenge goes but 
in this day and age, it is so extremely hard to do that. There's definitely different things we can replace certain plastic pieces with, but it's not an easy task. And but, I always yeah. say, let's, let's do what we can do. Mm -hmm. Maybe even just one little tweak and make a yep. little difference. Yep. It's there's, I've seen a really cool picture out there and it's about somebody on trying to climb a ladder and the rung is way above their hand. They can't reach it. And it's like going waste free or plastic free, but there are so many little steps that we can take that will get us there. We don't have to do it all at once. All right, we're going to move on to the next problem that I uh, decided to highlight here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I lost my bar. There we go. All right, plastic utensils. Uh, hey, what's that? Yeah. Disposable or single-use plastic is made of all types of materials. This can be confusing for recycling centers and these plastic forks, knives, spoons, and straws are very skinny and they slip through the machinery at the Mercs. Remember all of those moving parts? There's a lot going on there. So does anyone have a, any idea for smaller plastics? Um, and you can pop any ideas that you have into the Q&A. Miss Ward said that, that some of her uh, uh, fourth graders are writing to ban single use water bottles in school. Wow. wow. I think that's amazing. Um, and and is there something in place for folks who who didn't didn't bring a reusable or don't have the ability to get one? You know, thinking about access is important. That's that's a really cool. I will check the Wilston Observer for their letters to the editor. That's awesome. Yeah, and then um, also thinking of banning yeah single use plastic in all of Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> When you say plastic utensils, Miss Ward's third and fourth graders <laughs> shouted, boo! Hey, you know what? They are, ugh, I don't love them either, but I, I, when I eat out or I get takeout, if I don't remember my own, I'll take the utensils home. And even though they're supposed to be disposable, I'll wash them over and over again until they break. <laughs> so yeah. that's one thing you can do. All right, we're going to move on to the next one. Um, keep the questions and answers coming. Um, it's fine. I just don't want to lose too much time. Stretchy, so floppy. Oh. oh, sorry. Renee is just saying, uh, take materials that did slip through, heat them to a temp that they uh, stick together and send them through again. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, glom them together. That's cool. Um Seems like Renee is on a heat kick. Yeah. A lot of a lot of ideas with heat in it. That's kind of cool. Um, all right. Stretchy plastic. Vermont. I remember we were talking about the big old law and state funding. Vermont has banned plastic bags. What's happening here? Oh, it's my mouse pad. I see. Um, Vermont has banned plastic bags for shopping, but we still see them in um, bread bags here on this picture. Anyone know what that is? That's a technique for keeping weeds down. It's it's agricultural plastic. So it's just like a big old plastic bag, but for farming. <laughs> and that stuff is really hard to, uh, really, really, really hard to recycle um, because it's not only is it because it's so stretchy, but it's usually filled with a lot of dirt and like tiny rocks. And I don't know if any of you work with sharp tools, but dirt and rocks, that that will slow you right down and it, it's hard. <laughs> so yeah, maybe some of you know about a program I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. I'm going to wrap up. Um, if you don't have any ideas about what to do with plastic film, or if you do pop them into the question and answer, but the next part of this, I would like to give you some hope and show you some cool things that are going on in our, our world. <laughs> so it's, it's it, you know, it is it is up to us and it's not all up to us. So, um, oh, right. No, first I'm going to make things complicated. <laughs> um, when we are thinking about what to do for a solution for recycled, uh, recycling or reducing the amount on the shelves or whatever, 
you know, we need to think about three main things. You know, what's the best way to handle this? What's the best, what kind of tools do we need to make an alternative to plastic? What kind of tools do we need to recycle? What kind, how much heat do we need to meld everything together? So what, what's that part? Number two is how is this new idea going to pay the people that are working on it? Because unfortunately, um, we don't live in a world where we all volunteer 100% of the time. Um, folks need to feed their families and pay for housing. So how how is this idea going to make a little money as well? And then the third piece, which kind of ties into the money piece, is who who on this other end of the recycling, who's going to buy this product? Who's going to buy all of those plastic utensils that are smushed together? Who wants those? And what are they going to do with them? So it is a little complicated. Um, but yes, now now to hope. <laughs> <laughs> there's a million ways to be you know that there are the first one I'm going to talk about is Precious Plastics Precious Plastics is a really cool company that um, links people from all over the world and it links people who are concerned to people who want to collect plastic to people who have machinery to make things out of it and what do they do they make stuff like this that's their logo on the right so up top, we see a Thomas in the tank, Thomas, the tank engine, and um, somebody has made, they've, they found a mold to uh, make train tracks with it. There are so many different things you can do. And on the bottom, you can kind of see like a very colorful wall to a house. So precious plastics. And um, is it, Rhonda, is there a way we can like share with them? Like I can share them uh, links and, and things to different ideas that maybe they liked. Yeah, we can do um, a follow up email with just some uh, links in it to uh, for resources and such. Yeah, because some of these companies and things that some of them, um, you know, you can get involved with if, if it's something that you like. So precious plastic, essentially, um, yeah, it's just connecting the whole world to each other, which is really beautiful. And then making some cool stuff like not only this, but like wacky stuff, too. Yeah, we have a school actually in South Burlington that got a grant from CSWD year, a couple of years ago, and they actually made machinery from the plans of precious plastics cool. and we're yeah. taking like at the time we weren't accepting bottle caps. So that was like a huh. problem. So they were taking the bottle caps, shredding them up, and then they were um, working on doing some molds. Um, but it was uh, it was a pretty cool project, and that reminds me I should check in to see what they're up to these days. Super cool, yeah. The um, the molds and the machinery is like really like that's beyond my ability, but I'd love to see it in action. Super cool. The next project I'm going to talk about is washed ashore. So it's kind of similar, but not really. The way that it's similar is that they are collecting plastics in the environment and then making something new with it. So Precious Plastics doing that also, but Washed Ashore is doing something like this. They are taking, uh, they do a lot of beach cleanups. They take donations of plastic. Uh, they clean it. They separate it into their colors. And then they get volunteers and artists together and they do huge sculptures that travel the nation. You know, I saw this sea turtle down here was at the Smithsonian in um, Washington, D.C. They go all over the place. So why do you think they do marine animals? Why why is that so important to them? Like why why plastic and marine animals? You know, where where did they find this plastic, right? It was where the marine animals live. Um, here's a question that I don't know if any of you know, um, and I think my information is correct, but does anyone know what the single, um, like the most weight? So thinking of like, what kind of plastic is taking up the most weight in the ocean or in the oceans in all of the globe? Does anyone know who's, who's the culprit here? Let's let you think about that. I'll give you a clue. It's probably not you. <laughs> Mm. flippy floppy yes there's a lot of plastic bags but flippy floppy is not super heavy yeah so yeah we had one answer that was like oh flippy floppy so thinking like plastic film 
like you think about the sea turtles eating plastic bags because they look like jellyfish. Kids toys, that's another one. There's definitely, all of these things are there. The actual, what, what I have heard is um, it's fishing gear. You know, wow. it's lost nets, it's lost um, twine, uh, plastic twine. It, they have a lot of different types of uh, bins that they're carrying like tons and tons of fish with. A lot of that is taking up the most amount of weight in the ocean. So, yeah. And, and think about it, you know, when you're out on the sea, it's like there's big storms, you're losing stuff left and right. It's tough. So there's, there's something to think about. It's like, if you're interested in the oceans or rivers, like what's a way to keep, um, you know, machinery stuck to the boat and not in the ocean where, all right. Well, let's Ms. Pam also said plastic bottles. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're definitely, yep. Definitely out there. Um, okay. Rosalia project, another ocean themed one. Can you tell I love the ocean? The Rosalia Project is run by a, a group of scientists. They have this fancy sailboat that they sail around, you know, the globe, really. They will stop at coastal cities and schools, uh, do beach cleanups. They will count all of the things that they found and organize them to see what types of things really are taking up the most um, space for, as for plastic um, in the ocean. And they also, they came up with this really cool tool. I don't have a picture of it, but it's essentially something that goes in your washing machine. And it's kind of like a little coral piece. It catches all the microplastics that you're washing your clothes with. So all your fleeces and like certain blankets, they have a lot of plastic in them that just escape down the sewers, never to be seen again or gone into the ocean, you know, that microplastic thing. But this thing actually kind of snarls it and catches it. The Rosalia Project is a good one, and they do a lot of school programs. And, you know, if you guys are interested in that kind of thing, you know, this is a great place to get an internship. Um, cool thing. Rosalia, Rosalia Project is actually doing a data cleanup this Saturday in Burlington. Oh, wicked. So not just coastal, right? Because yeah. where do the rivers go? Where do they end up? We're all connected here. Um. Pam's asking, where do you get that? Oh, at the Cora ball. I will send you a link for that. Yeah, that's what the product is called to catch the plastic stuff in your washing machine as it gets tumbled around. Okay, so flippy floppy plastic, Nextrex. This um is this company, Nextrex, is actually guess who created it? The mobile oil company. Because remember how I said plastics are created from petrochemicals? Well, the mobile as in the gas station that you might know of, um, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out things that they can do to help clean up this plastic problem. So that's nice. Um, essentially, clean, dry, stretchy, flippy, floppy plastic all gets collected. You put it in a bag of its, of its own so it's not loose and flying around. And you can take this to a number of really large grocery stores like Aldi, um, Hannaford's, Shaw's, uh, probably Price Chopper, Market 32. Um, so they'll take all these things and take all of that back. And what do they create with it at Next Tricks? They create uh, plastic lumber. And guess what plastic lumber is great for? No splinters. <laughs> and it's good in the weather. You know, it doesn't break down. So this is one way that flippy floppy plastic is um, reused and turned into something great because Remember how I said our MRFs, they don't take flippy floppy plastic. It doesn't work like that. But next treks will. So this is a separate program. Um, the next one is TerraCycle, more hard to recycle things. Uh, candy wrappers, art supplies. If you have a lot of a certain item and you wish it was recyclable, check out the TerraCycle website and perhaps they will have a box that they can mail you. You can fill it up to the brim and send it back. Um, and then reusable only. Remember, it's really hard to get to zero waste, zero plastic, but maybe you can start to trade certain things, you know, either reuse your plastic as much as possible um, and just don't throw it away or get something that's wooden or glass and it's protected. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different 
things out there that we can do to reduce the amount of plastic, especially the stuff that we can't recycle. Uh, Big Al, Karen was wondering if we could uh, get, uh, if we can recycle all of these things if bagged together. All of these things. Um, maybe we're talking about the plastic film. Are you, yeah, are you referring, Karen, to the plastic film, the flip floppy plastic? In the meantime, um, Ms. Ward says, uh, we hope to work with you more in the future. Oh, we need to get to art class. Well, thank you guys for coming on and I will yeah. see you guys in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. I just wanted to end with, you know, you. I'm, I'm speaking to the kids out there, but for adult folks in there, <laughs> you are also a wonder. Um, fabulous. You has a long way to go in this world still. Uh, so what will you learn that makes you rock and roll? What future can you imagine? Learning never ends, creating never ends, and your ideas are worth the world. So sometimes the things that make us really fired up and angry, like plastic waste and microplastics and fishing nets that are strangling things, uh, sometimes that gives us the power to like really work on the stuff that we care about. And the first step is getting educated about it. What's actually really happening? That's exactly why I'm here today. I work in, you know, the waste industry so I can figure it out and I can see what, what is real. I see a lot of news headlines about this happening, that happening, but what's actually happening? And that's the first step. And I always find a lot of brilliant ideas come from the little minds. So that's, uh, that's awesome. So Karen was referring to the, um, um, I think, TerraCycle site in oh. Northwest Solid Waste District. Um, I, I don't know much about it. We don't do the TerraCycle thing here, but um, I know that TerraCycle is pretty specific about like putting, I think you have to put specific things yeah, in specific boxes. Yeah, if you're talking about TerraCycle, then that's, yeah, they have, yeah, very specific markers or candy wrappers or toothpaste bottles, like specifically. Um, and if you're talking about Trex, I'm not sure if that's one, like, yeah, there, there are some transfer stations um, that are flirting with the idea of, of taking it in plastic film. It's not something that we've been able to do yet at Wyndham Solid Waste, um, even though we keep trying Typically what we hear is like, well, the grocery stores take them so you can do that. But it is nice to have that one-stop shop. It is. So I know I'm probably going to go over on time here. So I just wanted to, you know, any last questions and also a big thank you to you all. Because we said 45 minutes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're kind of there. So if you all have any anything... Anything else? Uh, I really Pam appreciate y'all being thanks. here. Thank you. Awesome sauce. Doesn't look like it. Yeah. And then again, there's our emails. You can always email any yeah. one of us. We're happy to help out no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I will make sure to share some of those cool links. Um, there's definitely activities and information for adults and children alike in all of them um yeah pretty cool efforts going on out there that we can we don't always have to recreate the wheel there's nothing else coming in cool all right well with that i hope you all have a really great afternoon thank you for tuning in this should be up on youtube eventually so if you missed out and you want to see me fumble on my words you are so welcome. <laughs> Have a great weekend, all. Happy Earth Day on Monday. Yoo-hoo. All right.